Thank you, James, uh, and thank you, everyone, for what has been a really fabulous uh, symposium so far. So, Nicholas and I uh, are going to talk to you about Digital Voltaire, uh, which is a single author uh, online critical edition currently under construction, and it's based in the first instance on the complete works of Voltaire. Um, which includes roughly 2,000 works, um, including poetry, theatre, uh, history, scientific writings, fiction, philosophy, biblical criticism, polemical texts, alphabetical works, correspondence, fragments, notebooks, marginalia, and other attributed texts. These all come to about 15 million words. That's just Voltaire, not our apparatus. Um, in 205 volumes published between 1968 and 2022. As you can imagine, after 54 years, some of the early volumes begin to need some updates, but no one will ever print, much less buy, 205 volumes again for a second time. So the ambition is to make a digital version which can undergo updates to make it as authoritative as the print and crucially referenceable. There's also in parallel the challenge of how to make it uh, sustainable. So I'm going to give you a whirlwind overview of the content and structure and then Nicholas is going to address the question of the business model. So as you can all imagine, each work by Voltaire has all the standard apparatus and introduction, including a list of manuscript and print witnesses uh, from Voltaire's lifetime, information about the treatment of the copy text, the work itself, including authorial footnotes, variant readings and editorial notes, and any appendices. Here is an Oh, sorry, that's, yes, that's what we were going to do. Um, this is an example of uh, a typical page. Um, so at the top under the running head, you can see the, the main text. Uh, underneath that, there are two uh, of Voltaire's own footnotes labeled A and B. Then we have variants, which are queued to line numbers in the text. And at the bottom, uh, editorial notes. Sadly, not all pages are typical. There are many, many atypical pages, um, which our, our development team first was the dossier of horrors. So, uh, for example, I mean, I could have given so many different examples. Uh, here we've got a, a poem uh, by Voltaire, uh, starting on the recto pages, and his own notes were so uh, lengthy and numerous that we had to put all his footnotes on the verso pages, and then, of course, Everything gets its own variants uh, and footnotes. Um, here we've also got a, a facing pages thing going on. Uh, on the retro pages, we've got the modernized version of uh, uh, a manuscript, which is an unpublished draft. And on the verso, we've got diplomatic transcriptions, which goes as far as to include to, to point out how, how big the blank spaces were between different jottings. Uh, and a, a final example, uh, some beautiful, very copious marginalia, uh, where we had to actually put things in three different columns because Voltaire had certainly written too much. So I think you, you might be beginning to see that we're headed more uh, towards an haute couture model rather than a, a prêt-à-porter. Um, and it's a huge design and UX challenge, um, but digitization is also an opportunity to make this whole thing easier to navigate. So naturally, cross-references can become hyperlinks, tagged entities in TEIXML, uh, which involve the same kinds of soul searching that we've just heard about, um, can take advantage of linked open data possibilities, which then in turn can be used to create pages providing key bits of information at a glance, for example, of each work by Voltaire, uh, for people and events mentioned, for works by other people that are cited. These would serve as miniature hubs within the resource, 
giving an overview of each work, person, place, and uh, allowing users to navigate between works in new ways. In reading mode, users, different users may wish to see different features as they read, search and explore, from a perfectly uncluttered presentation of only Voltaire's text, to one that shows page numbers, um, or also line numbers, editorial notes, uh, and variant readings. We are providing both uh, a sophisticated faceted search and browse options by title uh, or date. Browsing or searching by date, uh, you'll see we've got a fair number of zeros in there at the moment, um, requires a single year to be assigned to each work, which is not always as obvious as it might sound. Um, but the, the information page for a work uh, could show all the relevant dates associated with it. So for its composition, which could be a range of years, uh, manuscript circulation, where applicable, and the first print publication, which in some cases can actually be after Voltaire's death. The resource also needs to be able to enable readers to follow up references to the print edition, allowing them to input volume and page numbers to be, allow them to be taken to a precise part of the text that they are seeking. And similarly, users must be able to cite the edition easily and generate URLs in a granular way to record and share their findings. Because of the complexity of what we want to develop, the resource is being developed in phases with multiple planned releases. So uh, the initial launch will be Voltaire's text minus correspondence and marginalia, critical apparatus including variants, browse, search, and uh, the ability to go to a specific reference. In phase two, we will add the correspondence and the marginalia, some metadata linking, some first content updates, uh, and so on. In addition to this archiving material, you say, wasn't that enough? We are constructing a set of resources under the heading of Voltaire Studio. Whatever the financial model ultimately adopted for digital Voltaire, the studio will remain open access. To date, this includes two databases. One, uh, the Library of Voltaire, brings together for the first time searchable records of every book and manuscript known to have been in the writer's own library, which currently housed in St. Peter's book. In what was a major challenge in designing the library, users are able to navigate the contents of the composite volumes that Voltaire created. He referred to these as his pourri, and there were nearly 200 such volumes in his library, composed of shorter pamphlets, brochures, uh, and manuscripts which he had bound together. The ability to reconstruct these volumes in the catalogue means that a user can search for the title of a work uh, so, in this case, uh, a letter to a member of parliament in the country. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that this was bound into uh, a pourpourri. Uh, so one can uh, click on that to look at the contents and then uh, navigate to another work in the same collection and so on. Alongside the library uh, is the catalogue of manuscripts relating to Voltaire, a digital union catalogue pulling together international holdings of manuscripts by or about Voltaire, which we think will come to over 20,000. It pushes the boundaries of what a catalogue is, uh, with each record identifying multiple sets of keywords, uh, information on content, details of material aspects such as watermarks and or signs of use location and provenance. It also gives direct links to repositories and digitized copies when available. The same collections functionality uh, that's used in the library here allows readers to see the contents of bound volumes of manuscripts 
but also what we call conceptual collections. Uh, so uh, all the different manuscripts relating to a single work or letter by Voltaire, for example. The result is a rich resource that will significantly impact Voltaire scholarship, and in fact, it's already generating new discoveries. Once Digital Voltaire is launched, uh, links will be added, taking users from individual records in the catalogues to pertinent places in the works, as well as in the other direction. There are further plans to expand the studio in other ways, including a biography, a timeline, and iconography. The considerable single author resource in question then will comprise um, the digital reimagining of an archival paper resource conceived to enable revisions and updates alongside the studio uh, made up of new born digital material and research tools. We anticipate that the interconnections between the different parts of the resource will not only make for a stimulating intuitive reading and working experience, uh, but that they will generate new insights. The programme just described clearly involves considerable investment now and over the long term, and for this reason, questions of sustainability and the business model are central, and Nicholas will talk about those now. Just use the forward arrow key. Forward key, excellent. Thank you, Robert. First of all, thank you, James, for your organizing this, this wonderful meeting and for your warm hospitality to James and all his colleagues. Um, well, the, a project as large and ambitious as the one that um, Julian's just been outlining um, obviously poses huge challenges. How do we fund it, obviously, but also how do we connect it to the readers that it, that it deserves now and in the future? Um, and you know how it is when you apply for funding for any digital project, the, whichever the body is you're applying to, they always have two criteria. One is sustainability and one is open access. And they never quite come clean that the two, of course, exist in um, uh, exquisite sort of contratensions. Um, the, so we've got to think about this. We sold the 205 paper volumes in the traditional way. We sold these books to university libraries. And that's the model the Voltaire Foundation has had uh, in all its existence. So the question we're now facing is, how, what do we do with this digital model? We want it to be, as far as we can, as sort of authoritative as the paper edition. We don't want it to be seen as a digital spin-off. We want it to be, in some ways, paradoxically, to supplant and replace the paper edition. We want it to have that sort of authority. So how do we finance it? Um, the, huge, the temptation is to think, could we do this with open access? Um, uh, so uh, here's Peter Baldwin, who's recently published a very robust um, uh, rather gang ho defense of open access. I'll leave you to read the, 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 the book that just came out last year, um, which you can read on open access. Um, and put like that, uh, in the way he describes it there, how could you possibly disagree? Um, but the problem is someone, somewhere along the line, has to pay. Um, we're beginning now to have some successful models for making journals open access, um, but open access for what the funding agencies call long-form long scholarly work, so monographs, scholarly editions, that's much more of a challenge. Um, now, I, I apologise for talking about the UK situation, but that's the one I'm particularly working in, but it applies to all of us. Um, for the next REF, so 2029, um, there's talk that monographs will have to be open access. It's, I mean, articles were for the you know, for last REF, and so this is focusing attention. Um, and there was a very interesting article, which you may not have seen, in the Times Higher, by Anthony Cond and Jane Bunker. Um, Anthony is the head of the Liverpool University Press. Jane Bunker is the head of Cornell University Press. Um, and they're arguing here, it's a short article, I definitely thought you can get it online, I recommend it. They're arguing quite strenuously against what seems to be the RAF proposal for monographs at the next RAF. Um, and the idea is that monographs, what they call long-form scholarship, are they right? Long-form without a hyphen, which really bugs me when that's not relevant. Um, they want long-form uh, work, like monographs, to be submitted, made open access by submitting the author-accepted manuscript, uh, so sort of green access, green open access. In other words, you put online in your university repository the uncopy edited text <laughs> Um, and this article argues rather strongly against that. 
they say it undervalues the, the input of the scholarly publisher. Well, they would, wouldn't they? But on the other hand, they have a point. And they argue, I think persuasively, that it creates a divide between different institutions. There will be, in the UK context, there will be some institutions that can't afford to buy the book, so the students will rely on the inferior version, whereas the posher institutions will buy the book and have the, so have effectively a different product. Um, and they also suggest that there are other ways we could think about open access, and they talk about collective action in the shape of library subscriptions, and what, how might one better use library subscriptions to render other um, uh, products open access. Um, so I'd like to say something briefly about the UKRI. Again, I'm apologizing for focusing on the UK, but they, they, all these papers have been published in the last 12 months. Um, and there's been, there's been a whole welter of, of things. I'm, I'm certainly not attacking the UK, all right, because I think they're paying for our lunch. But um, <laughs> they say something very interesting. They, the original policy on open access from November last year talks about long form um, scholarship, they mean monocross, but they explicitly exempt scholarly editions, which I think is interesting. That means they sort of recognize that there is a problem. So they're not even proposing the AAM system for scholarly editions. Um, this has been followed up by, um, as you can see, uh, um, something that came out in March this year about a fund for long-form outputs, in other words, publishing subsidies for monographs. There is no mention in that document, it's all online, there's no mention of scholarly editions at all. Um, they've now launched a consultation on open access policy for the next REF, um, and again, they're talking about uh, monographs, long form, there's actually no mention there of, um, of scholarly editions. So there, I think everyone who's interested in this ought to answer, I've got to do this next week, we should all send something into this consultation <laughs> and focus their attention. They, they've already admitted that it's exempt from their policy from last November. So I think we need to encourage you, Cara, to start thinking about more specific funding for scholarly editions. They, this is a, a, it's quite important that we think how we might be able to do this using open access. And I think that could be. They've opened the door in one way by exempting scholarly editions, so I think we ought to encourage them to think that's a source of possible funding in the future. Um, so the scholarly edition, I think in, in terms of open access, I think the scholarly edition in some ways is, is more difficult for open access than the monograph, a whole range of, of reasons. Uh, and I'll just go through some of them quickly. The obvious one is sustainability. Um, but if a monograph costs money to sustain it, the scholarly edition will cost even more so because the sorts of resources we've been thinking of, it was in the debate this morning, um, these are revolving resources. The, the Voltaire resource that we're thinking about is not going to be static, it's going to be constantly changing and constantly revised. We want, to, we want it to incorporate new scholarship. Um, we even were thinking about creating a sort of journal or a, 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 a sort of notes and queries style journal where people can you know, the, the, the research and the new thinking that's generated by the resource can then be published by the resource and in due course incorporated. Um, so this is not quite crowdsourced scholarship. This, there will be an editorial board, as I guess we say. We're being quite old-fashioned about this. That, that we, will, we will want to vet the, 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 the submissions, but this will be a sort of collective project where it will generate the research and will then be incorporated into the product. That requires cash. That needs to be sustained, uh, let alone the other more basic sustainability. Um, there's a second point which I, for me is really important, which is not often mentioned, which is that open access necessarily operates within the legal structures of a particular jurisdiction. Um, but if, if you, the Voltaire Foundation, we're very tiny, but we publish not only Voltaire, we publish other things as well. We work in two languages. Everything we do can be in French or in English. And so what we publish has international ambitions, obviously. Um, so open access is a bit of a headache if you want to publish in two languages and if you aspire to work across national boundaries and not reinforce them. So you know, it's, it's all very well to have open access in the UK, but how would that work in, in other countries? Well, you can see how the, the, the funding issues can be complicated. Uh, there's another issue about the scholarly presses. I think Anthony Cond and Jane Barker do have a point. Um, traditional presses are, are usually vilified by open access and enthusiasts who always call Elsevier and the evil science publishers. Um, it's not quite the same in humanities. I mean, scholarly editions are normally very, very complex works. They're normally full of, uh, and I look at Jim as I say this, who used to lead a team of copy editors. I mean, that they deal with a lot of detail, lots of dates and variants and facts. Um, I, we haven't yet met the creator who gets all this perfect on the first, on the first attempt. It, it requires a lot of scholarly input. 
until now by publishing teams, really, um, to get this right. Um, and that, of course, means, by the way, that the AAM solution, where you sub sub submit the manuscript pre copying is absolutely, it's not really very good at monograph, it will be catastrophic for the scholarly edition, it just doesn't work. Um, another point about scholarly presses, of course, is that they don't just help copy it and improve and prepare the text, they also then help promote it once it's been published. Um, we're all of us here authors, and we all have a, a quite a touching belief that once our work is freely available, everyone, everyone in the world will rush to read us. Well, I don't want to disappoint you, but you know, they don't. And um, what traditional presses have is they have sales and marketing teams. And even if the book is um, open access, you might not need the sales team, you still need the marketing team. In other words, we need for these projects a sustained marketing and communication strategy to make sure that the resource gets to all the users it needs to get to. Um, and we need a strategy to grow the reader base as it, as it evolves. Um, and finally, um, I, I put their reference, referenceability. Um, there is something slightly strange, but, but there is actually some evidence that if you ask people how they respond to those resources, they often think if something is free, um, that it's actually not quite as good as something you might have to pay for, which is one of the paradoxes of open access. But I mean, this is a reflex, it might change in the future. Um, but if we wanted to promote Volta as an open access edition, um, we somehow need to promote the idea that this is as, has the same heft as the paper edition, or actually, it's a bit like the New Oxford Shakespeare, where this will, where the digital edition has the name of Oxford behind it and, and the name of Shakespeare behind it. So we need to promote the digital edition as, as having the heft of the authoritative edition, the edition that you quote in the footnotes. Um, that sounds like a pedantic detail, but I don't think it is. And we haven't quite got to the stage where scholars are all confident. I mean, after all, all scholars are so keen on DH as we are. We want people to have the confidence that the digital edition is the one that is referenceable. Um, and that is, paradoxically, that is also a challenge for open access. Now, um, how will we do this in the case of Voltaire? Well, the the sort of cowardly solution will be to do with the digital what we did with the paper edition and to sell it. We could go to University Press and we could ask them to, some presses will sell uh, resources that they didn't produce themselves. Um, we did it with Electronic Enlightenment over 15 years ago, the VF developed it and we sold it through OUP and it still sells through OUP and it makes a profit which employs the, the staff who run it. So there is that traditional model but it's not open access. Um, the sort of ideal solution will be to make the whole project open access, but to do that it would need some very innovative thinking um, and it will probably need a donation from a, a, some charitable or fun, some foundation uh, to, to at least enable the thing to be set up. Um, but there, is, there, there are examples, so for example, um, not, examples not from yet from uh, scholarly editions, for example, from journals. Um, Liverpool University Press, for example, in the UK, is currently, I think, one of the leading presses that's looking at new ways of, of, of producing open access. And they use something called the subscribe to open model, S2O, where you use the existing subscriber base of one product to flip, that's the word they was used, to flip a journal and make that open access. So you say to <coughs> librarians, if 200 of the world's leading libraries continue to subscribe to this journal, uh, we will make that, in addition, freely accessible. So it's a sort of deal that appeals to the librarian's sense of um, communal honour. And actually, it does seem to work, and Liverpool are in the process of flipping a number of quite major journals, most recently French Studies, which is the top French literature journal in, in Britain. Um, so whether one could do something like that with the Voltaire edition it's something I'd, I'm, I'm exploring, but it does need some sympathetic foundation to, to help you bring about the transition. Um, in the short term, a, a, at least a compromise will be to, to do a sort, of hybrid, a sort of hybrid approach. So I've given you there the, the model that, that Julian was just explaining. Um, one thing we're thinking about is whether the fully digitized print edition, which you've got on the left, could be sold on subscription through a publisher. That will give us some income that would help sustain, well, would help pay some salaries to sustain the product going forward. But we will make freely available um, 
well, first of all, the Voltaire Studio, that's to say all the complementary resources that weren't in the print edition, but which in future are going to be connected to the print edition, including um, the, the catalogue of the library and the catalogue of manuscripts. Um, and also we might give away, I think, um, freely, the, the plain text. So you would have the plain text, which is 50 million words, longer than the Bible. Um, all that would be free, but people would pay to have the, 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 um, all the scholarly apparatus and the, the ability to search among it, which of course is a very powerful research tool. So that's a possible hybrid model. It's, I'm not, as you can probably sense from the way I'm presenting it, it's not totally satisfactory, but it would be a way of having an OE element into a, into a, into a business model. Um, I think, to conclude, I'll say something very simple, which is that scholarly editions matter. They, they, they don't make up... Obviously, there are two ways of thinking about it. We can have a passion about a particular author or a particular text and want to make our edition. Um, overall, scholarly editions may not make up a very large percentage of research publications in literature and history, but actually high-level, authoritative, reference, referenceable editions are actually fundamental to great humanities research. Just take that last talk about that wonderful medieval Irish text. Um, obviously, a new edition there is going to be really very powerful in actually creating new thinking about medieval literature. Um, so if we can get this right, open access definitive editions will be a really powerful stimulus to the best research in the humanities. And that's an argument we could use with the UKRI and other equivalent funding agencies to say this is something that they should help support. Um, I, I quote, at the beginning, I quoted Peter Baldwin, um, and he's the great pioneer of open access. Um, his ideal of knowledge as a global public goal is one that go, actually goes back to the Enlightenment. He doesn't say that, but it does go back to the Enlightenment, what we used to call the Age of Voltaire. So thinkers of the Enlightenment had particular disdain for book hoarders, people who collected books and didn't share them with other scholars. And the word they used for it is bibliotaph. And you find bibliotaph, so, so the, 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 the person who puts books in a tomb. And, um, and the, the English language uses bibliotaph, and the French language has bibliotaph, the words are both used. The encyclopedia has an article on bibliotaph, and I particularly like the OED um, entry. Um, uh, it says the word bibliotaph is obsolete and um, depreciative. I love, the, I love the pompous tope of the OED, but depreciative a depreciative term. So it's a tomb for books and later a person who hoards books without reading them. Um, well, I think what that shows you is that worry about open access actually starts in the age of Voltaire with bibliotaphs. What we now need to do is to come up with some innovative schemes between us so we can actually beat the bibliotaphs and make Voltaire open access. Thank you very much.